Now we're ready to begin. Ready to begin the second in what could really be countless Yurim and Megillat Esther. As we'll see Be'ezrat Hashem next week as we continue to discover the third methodology that we're going to incorporate in our learning, namely that of illusions and various illusions as well in Megillat Esther. But tonight we're going to incorporate a different methodology or employ a different genre, and that is namely to focus on the characters and particularly character development in Megillat Esther as we're going to see noting how characters develop at moments of crises and uh, together with that also to employ what's known as the structural motif, identifying the structure which we're going to see according to most parshanim and scholars today is very much in consonance with the character development. So without further ado, we're going to take a look firstly at trying to identify as one does within any plot who the primary, the secondary, and in fact, the Megillat Esther, which is going to be replete with various tertiary characters as well. So we begin with the difference or the distinction between uh, these three forms of characters. A primary character, as we know, is not only going to be the protagonist, sometimes the antagonist of a story, but easier, again, just to locate the, uh, the general hero of the story or the primary character in the exposition of the story, in which case it seems that as we open up Megillat Esther, Vahi Bimei Achashverosh. He perhaps, and we're going to see how the author is going to play off on this, is certainly presented as uh, the protagonist of the story. He seems to be the one who clearly fits the definition of a primary character, namely someone who propels the plot of the story. The plot is basically about him. He is going to be in the spotlight of the story, and uh, ultimately it's his character whom we are anticipating is going to develop. Now, very often in Tanakh, we find that in the exposition, we will be introduced to uh, the primary character, generally the protagonist, again, of the story. And yet, in the case of Megillat Esther, we're going to see that there is a little bit of a shift or perhaps even question that the author very much wants us to pay attention to, namely, who is the true protagonist? With this, we continue with the secondary characters, namely, those that help the primary characters propel the events of the plot. But as many literary analysts will tell us, the secondary characters have an additional role, and that is to highlight the primary character, generally through the device of a foil character. In other words, very often the secondary characters will serve not necessarily as less important characters, but rather those that will highlight the character traits, very often the flaws of, at times, even the tragic protagonists of the story. So we're going to pay attention to who the secondary characters are. And last but not least, particularly in our study of Megillat Esther, we can ignore the numerous tertiary characters. Very often, especially in earlier literature, I'm referring even to uh, the origins of the Greek drama, we find a primary character and, and a secondary character. However, Megillat Esther is certainly, and I would even say ahead of its time, with regard to uh, the number of tertiary characters. These are, as, in, in, as uh, certainly, seen by the name, third-degree characters, namely those that help the secondary characters propel the plot of the story, even though they generally don't necessarily highlight the secondary characters. Very often, they only appear in one scene, and usually and as peripheral characters in the scene. And the reason why we can't ignore them in Megillat Esther is because there are tertiary characters in every single scene. And what is so unique to Megillat Esther is that more often than not, there are actually names that are afforded to these tertiary characters. It's true that we have Sarisim, various eunuchs and tunics in Shushan Habira. We also have, again, Achashta Pnei HaMelech, those that are going to be the messengers of the king to send the first letters, the second letters out to the 127 provinces, Mehodu Ve'ad Kush. We also have Ro'e Pnei HaMelech, the private cabinet of the king. We have the Yodei Ha'itim, the astrologers, basically the Chachamim, the sages who advise the king, especially with regard to personal affairs. We have and those that are going to be closest, the Sarim, as well to the king. But what's interesting is that more often than not, these particular Sarisim, Ro'e Pnei HaMelech, Yodei Ha'itim, 
if not one, sometimes more, are actually given names, which is the author's way of telling us, pay attention to these characters because there is more than meets the eye. So with this, we're going to get started. As we mentioned, it's pretty clear, apparently, who the, uh, the primary characters are as we begin the story. As we said, the author in the exposition will introduce us to Achashverosh, the ruler, the one who seemingly is in control. The story seems to be, at, to be about him, and here's a very good example of how the structure is going to highlight that by virtue of the inclusio format. Just as the story begins with the strength of the king, the expanse of his empire, 127 lands, so too, how does this Megillah end? It ends with the king issuing a mass al kol ha'aretz hayam. There is going to be a tax, a fiscal tax that will be placed on all the citizens in this vast empire, giving us the impression, in fact, that this is going to be a significantly strong kingdom ruled by the king Achashverosh. Even though uh, we are going to revisit this protagonist, let's continue and see who the next character who is giving, given a seemingly similar exposition is, and that would be none other than Mordechai. As we discussed last week, we hear about his genealogy, and he is the son of Yair Ganashimi Kish Ishimini Asharoglam Yushalayim. We hear about the historical context as well, and clearly Mordechai is the one who will propel the major events, not only with regard to his taking care of his cousin Esther, but certainly as the plot begins, it's going to be Mordechai who goes out in a public arena to the streets in his sackcloth. He's going to be the one to further the events that lead ultimately to the salvation of the Jews in Shushan. And sim similarly, as we found Achashverosh mentioned both at the beginning and the end, it's not only Achashverosh who is going to exert power and control by the end of the story. We have Mordechai, Mishneh Lamelech, who continues, Doresh Tov La'amo, V'dover Shalom L'chol Zaro, which uh, tells us now we have a second, which uh, is already more than the usual story. We have two primary characters. Actually, there seemingly is a third, namely, ah, so Esther we're going to speak about in just a moment. But before we get to Esther, there clearly is another exposition that's given for Achar Hadbar Ma'ila Gidal HaMelech HaChashveroshet Haman Ben Hamdata. And that's why the Gemara Masech Megillah discusses the debate amongst various Tanaim with regard to where the actual beginning of Megillah Esther is with regard to our obligation to listen to the entire Megillah. Does it start with Kol Tokfo, the strength of Achashverosh as depicted in the very first chapter, first Pasuk? Is that where we have to start? Or maybe we should really start in Perak Bet with the introduction of our Jewish hero, namely Mordechai HaYehudi. Or maybe we can wait until Perak Gimel, Achar HaDvarim HaElah Gidal HaMelech HaChashverosh HaTaman, which is truly not only the 12th year, which is going to continue to be the historical context of Megillah Tester, but it's going to be the chapter where we finally see how the plot thickens. So uh, with this, uh, we know that in the end, the Gemara concludes, we're going to start with Perak Aleph, with Achashverosh. But don't forget about these other opinions as well, because there seemingly are two other characters, primary characters, one a protagonist, namely Mordechai, the other the antagonist, the villainous Haman in the story. But that's not where it ends. You all had mentioned Esther. We're going to note, however, that Esther does not begin as a primary character, but is actually one of numerous secondary characters in a much more passive role from the outset, but one that is going to help move the plot along. So with this, we're going to pay attention now to some of these secondary characters and then even some of the tertiary characters. So without further ado, let's start actually with the very first secondary character who's mentioned, namely Vashti. Vashti, who etymologically, we already are sensitive to which, which word that we hear in her name, Mishte. Gam Vashti Asta Mishte. That is her entire persona. As a matter of fact, it seems that there isn't really much that the secondary character does. Albeit, if I, if I would ask you what is her function within Megillah Tester, you would all say that she's the one who ultimately opens the position for Esther to become queen. However, there's more than that. 
Gam Vashti Astamishte. She is depictive of the Persian culture, but in a somewhat comical form. As we said, in Persian culture, the women, this is pre Betty Frieda and feminist times, again, uh, the women are really viewed as perfume bottles, as mere trophy wives, as depicted in the story itself. But she seems to be a more active woman in the story, as she herself is going to portray the culture of the parties of Shushan. And we said the parties, which is probably not the exact definition of mishte, which ultimately means the intoxication, that's right. These are drinking parties, which Vashti also is going to have by virtue of the fact that her husband is engaged for seven days. And uh, the Yemei Miluim, as we discussed last week, basically these inaugural parties in the Chatzar of Habinata, HaMelech HaChashverosh, in uh, the courtyards of the palace of the palatial city of Shushan Habira. And what is it that Vashti is going to perform? What is her activity as we see? Well, first we find that she is going to, uh, to be described as Tovat Marehi. Now, just for a moment, we're going to have to put our midrashic knowledge aside because very often when we picture Vashti, we picture her, as Chazal tell us, with Shechin, again, with some type of skin disease or a rash that broke out, or I heard someone say a tail, that's right. However, Imshat, she's actually described as quite beautiful. She is Tobat Mar'e. So if your daughter wants to dress up for Vashti, for Purim, again, you may want to encourage her, albeit we're going to see the tragic ends. Tobat Marehi, and what is her activity? Beyond Astamishte, beyond her participation in the culture of Persia, Pasuk Yudbet, all we know about her, Vatima'en Hamalka Vashti Lavo Bidvar Hamela Hasher Biyat Hasarisim, on one hand, we understand that her character is meant to serve clearly as the secondary character who propels now the opening for Esther. But if that's truly the case, then really what the authors could have easily have done is really started the story in the second chapter where we hear that there's a vacancy for the primary queen and uh, the role of the Gvira, the queen mother, and just explain because the previous queen had disobeyed the king, giving us the impression that if the author is going to pay attention to these details, then they are quite important. And we're going to see how significant Vashti's character is, not only as foreshadowing for the plot of the story, but certainly to highlight other characters in the story. So all we know about her is that she refuses to follow the edict of the king, namely to appear before him, and no explanation is given. All we know is vatima'en. As a result, Mimuchan, whom we're going to see, is one of the karov, one of the yodei ha'itim, the chachamim, the sages of the king, He's the one to propose. Alasher lo asta et mamar hamelech. Vashti is going to have consequences, not so much by virtue of what she did, and as much as because of what she did not do. Vayomer mamuchan lepne hamelech vahasarim lo ala melech levado avta Vashti hamalka. Ki al kol hasarim v'al kol ha'amim asher b'chol medinot hamelech achashverosh. Now let's just take a look at what Mamuchan argues. He says, even though it looks like Vashti has just performed a personal offense. Don't worry, Ahasuerus, this was not a personal offense. Rather, it's a national one. This has to be viewed as a national affront because now all the women are going to start refusing the orders of their husbands. And this, as we discussed last week, is going to be the initiative for what Chazal are going to call very silly first letters, those that are going to declare, kol ish sorer beveto umedaber kilshon amo. Now the edict has to be nationalized, namely that all husbands are the rulers in their own home, speaking, as we said, the language of the husband, pasukhaf, and this became also part of the culture, the adage. These were, again, the PR that went out. We're going to return to Memuchan as a tertiary character in just a moment. But as of now, this is all we know of Ashti until Perakabet. And now we appreciate the true role of a secondary character. We don't know this yet, but the author already knows the end of the story. And therefore, in portraying Esther in Perak as follows, 
There clearly is not simply a resonance to the introduction of the character of Ashti, but clearly a parallel antithesis foil that is going to be presented. Pasuk Zayin, our introduction to Esther, immediately after hearing about Ish Yehudi Mordechai, Vahi Omein et Hadassa. Now we hear about his role as literally nursemaid to Hadassa. He is the one to provide nourishment for her. He Esther Batodo. This is Esther, by the way, let's look carefully at the terminology, not his niece, as many interpret, but rather his younger cousin. Ki ein la avaim, ara yifatowar vitovat mare. And it's true that Chazal compare Esther here to the other beautifully mentioned woman in Tanakh, but within the context of Megillat Esther, the authors are telling you, who should she remind you of? Vashti. Think of Vashti. Esther is compared to Vashti, telling us that we are meant to see the two as uh, foils one for the other. So Esther is beautiful. And uh, now we're going to see the next few verbs associated with her. But Esther, as opposed to Vashti on one hand, who really does not perform any activity, she does remind us a little of Vashti by virtue of the fact that Vashti's primary offense or her action was a passive action, namely what she didn't do. So let's take a look at Esther. Esther is first presented to us as a very timid, certainly passive, very submissive character. And it could very well be not only because of her age, her position within the family, her position within the culture as a young woman in, in Persia at the time, but the verbs associated with Esther at the beginning, Esther is taken. Notice all of the reflexive verbs that are employed over here. Namely, Esther doesn't do anything. Rather, she finds favor in a passive manner. So too, Hegai gives her. She is the recipient. Again, very passive. Or even as uh, she's going to make her way to the palace of the king, Pasuk Tedvav, Uvahagia Tor Esther. Instead of telling us that Esther Magia herself, that Esther approaches, no, her turn approaches. It is her opportunity now to come to, to the Beit HaMelech, Lo Biksha Davar, as if that surprises us now. She doesn't request anything because. She doesn't want anything, but also because that's her personality. She is not proactive in any way, shape, or form. Even the terminology that explains to us how ultimately she is going to be selected by the king, vati Esther no seitchen. Notice it's not v'chuneka. She doesn't find grace, rather no seitchen. She carries this in a very passive form as well. And even when she is going to be crowned as queen, what does she continue to do? Let's take a look at Pasuk Chaf. Ein Esther magedet moladeta vetama kasher tziva aleha Mordechai. She is a very obedient character as well. She is going to follow everything that Mordechai literally commands upon her. Vet mama Mordechai Esther osa. The double terminology. Whatever Mordechai not just commands, but whatever he says, Esther does. Kasher haita ba'amna ito. Because she basically is continuing the same persona that developed or that she was conditioned to as she was literally nursed by him. And therefore, the authors once again go out of their way to portray Esther here, albeit she makes it to at the king's palace, but she is still a secondary character. Secondary to whom, clearly, to Mordechai, and at the same time, very similar to Vashti. She basically has replaced Vashti as the secondary character in the king's court. But this we're going to see is going to change. Not in uh, the first parak, but only afterwards, and we're going to return, therefore, to Esther. But just take a look as we fast forward to a moment to Perak Zion, where we hear that Esther, in addition to being the one who finally does approach the king, in addition to being the one who uh, heroically is going to be in the forefront, wherein Mordechai is going to serve more on the streets of Shushan 
Esther is going to be the one ultimately to deal in a very active manner in front of the king. As we see, she herself is going to ask of the king not only the first party, but when she incriminates Haman at the second party. But I'd like you to take a look at the true foil that the authors go out of their way to portray between Vashti and Esther. Namely, what is it that Esther does? Firstly, she explains to Mordechai, I'm not allowed again to even go in front of the king uninvited because that would be disobedient. That would be basically performing, in addition to a very active initiative, true, that would also be performing exactly what Vashti does. And Esther herself understands that. I have not been called for the past 30 days. If I go uninvited, then what will happen? The same thing that happened to Vashti. And all we know about Vashti is that she was banished from her position. What lead us to believe that she was ultimately killed off is that Esther says, if I disobey the king, everyone knows. Then what happens? And then you are killed. And therefore, Esther says, I can't do this. There really is precedence. Think about Vashti. Vashti is there to remind me that I am not allowed to disobey the king. Ultimately, what does Esther do? She's exactly like Vashti. She disobeys the king, but not in a, a passive form. The irony is that she becomes the active disobedient character. She is going to disobey the king by appearing before the king. In which case, note then how the author goes out of his way to basically portray these two secondary characters. One is a foil for the other. And as we know, Esther, who ultimately, and we'll see how and when, becomes a primary character. In which case, Vashti is presented from a character development perspective as the foil for Esther. Esther is so similar. They both are the queens who are supposed to be submissive to their husbands. Both are going to be disobedient. Both are beautiful, by the way. But Esther is going to do this for a different reason, one that she explains very clearly to the king. Why am I going to be so proactive and disobedient? She explains, Tinatenli nafshi b'shelati va'ami b'vakashati. The entire initiative stems from my request to save not myself, but my people. Note that Esther is going to be disobedient, knowing that she is risking her life, but she is willing to do this for the sake of her people. In other words, she's going to put, as we'll soon see, her selfish motives aside and instead allow her selfless nature to come, tr to come through. She is going to go out of her way to, uh, on one hand, disobey the king, but ultimately to save her people. Which brings us back to the story of Vashti. Note how the author didn't tell us why she disobeys the king. Why Vatsima'en Vashti? Why she refuses to appear before the king? I'm sure she also knows the harsh consequences. And through Esther, we find out if Esther is going to perform this for selfless reasons, then it must be that Vashti disobeyed the king for selfish reasons. There are no national goals that she expresses, giving us the impression that these are two women who actually are very similar, not only externally, but personality-wise as well. The difference is, ultimately, their motivation. One is motivated by self selfish concerns, and that's why Chazal fill in the blank. What could be her selfish concerns? It must be that she was embarrassed by her looks. She broke out in shechin. It must be that she developed a tail because she had animalistic features. It must be that she was asked to appear in nude because, again, and she was embarrassed for her own dignity. It must be about her own dignity because Esther is her foil. And Esther does this not for the sake of her dignity, but rather for the dignity of her nation. Which brings us now to Zeresh. And this is where the plot thickens. What do I mean by this? If you thought that Esther only has one foil, then wait till you see what happens. Vashti is already out of the scene. And Vashti was really Esther's foil as a secondary character. But once Esther is already going to take the lead as a primary character, then there's going to be another foil character presented for her. 
and many don't necessarily pay attention to this, and therefore, I would like to re-examine the plot around Esther and around Zeresh. And what do I mean by this? I mean the plot, not necessarily of the story, but that that Esther devises. Please keep in mind that Mordechai encouraged Esther to do what? What did he tell her? How are you going to go about to sa saving the Jewish people? All you have to do is present your case before the king and by virtue of the fact that you are part of this nation it must be as Mordechai says explicitly you must go before the king that's what he requests of her all you have to do is go before the king and ask him on behalf of your nation Basically, you are a representative of your nation and you happen to be the queen. To which Esther basically explains, no Mordechai, if I do that, I'm basically risking my life. And this is her own Pascal's wager. That just to picture for a moment, what does she tell herself? She says, look, if I go before the king uninvited, then what will happen? I'm going to be killed. That's right. If, and by the way, what will happen to the Jews then? They'll be killed. And, and by the way, if I don't go before the king, then what will happen? I'll survive. And what will happen anyway? The Jews are going to be killed anyway. So basically, she says, look at this wager. Again, in any case, there's more than a 75% chance that the Jews are going to be killed, and I will together with them. The one possibility is that I will go and survive. Even if I survive, chances are that there is no way that the king who issued the edict of annihilation without, by the way, once mentioning that we're speaking about the Jews, the king is not going to repeal this. And by the way, from the ensuing events of the story, we know that she's 100% correct. Which bring us now to Esther's plan. First, we're going to see Mordechai has to point out to her, no, I'm not talking about physical survival. Because actually, Esther, you're drawing Pascal's wager entirely incorrectly. It's not about your physical survival. As a matter of fact, if you don't go before the king, then I'm not really so concerned with the Jewish people. Who remembers from last week? Why isn't he concerned? There are Jews living in Makom Acher. There are Jews living in Eretz Yisrael. They're completely safe. They don't have to worry about Islamic fundamentalism or, again, uh, the breakdown of, of de Tocqueville's America. They don't have to worry about any of this. Again, uh, they're going to survive. I'm worried about you. If you don't take an active role right now, then then you are going to basically dismiss yourself of any Jewish identity, and that means the end of your parents' line. That basically means not just complete assimilation, but it also means that you are going to allow the line of Jewish identity to end. So really, I'm concerned with you. To which Esther now agrees, and therefore she's going to go before the king, but not right away. Firstly, as we discussed, she needs all the Jews to identify publicly as Jews. She needs three days of fasting to show that they truly identify and are now going to finally stop this trend of assimilation. But then she doesn't go before the king and ask to save the Jewish people. Rather, she devises a plot. And now we understand why we needed three chapters of foreshadowing before the plot actually thickens. What does she tell herself? In order to stop this, not just this decree of Haman, but as soon as I repeal this decree, what's going to happen? I'm sure Haman is going to find another means to annihilate the Jewish people. This is the trend then of anti-Semitism. And therefore she says, I need Haman banished. I need him out of here. Well, just like Esther, there's only one precedent that we're familiar with in the story so far. And what is that? Who was banished? Vashti. How is Vashti banished? So Esther is brilliant. How many of you have seen the film Inception? Inception is all about, I know for those who haven't seen it, this is part of your Purim homework, Shushan Purim, or no, depending on where you live. Again, namely, it's a, a film which is all about, again, I say a little bit of nevua, but about how people can condition one's mind, right? How basically you can frame a person simply by planting suspicion in their heads. Isn't that fascinating? Esther is completely brilliant. She basically says, hmm, let me create the context, the only context that I'm familiar with, through which the king was willing to banish someone so close to him as his own wife. 
So help me out over here together with Esther. What is Esther thinking? If I could set the scene again for Vashti, what would I do? Well, all I know about the Vashti scene is exactly what the authors have told me. Number one, she was banished through what context? It was a mishteh. So there was a lot of drinking going on, but that's not enough. Do you remember what did, what did the author describe? It was already after seven days of drinking, wherein uh, the king, so I have to make sure that he reaches a state of inebriation. Then, again, what do I have to do? Why was Vashti dismissed, banished, killed? Because she disobeyed the king. And uh, she disobeyed the king, one can argue, in two realms. What were the two realms in which she disobeyed him? Well, a very personal one. This is the queen who was asked to basically show off the grandeur of the kingship. So on one hand, it's his wife. So a very personal affair. That has a double connotation. And in addition to that, who was this supposed to be in front of, if you remember? To show her off in front of all of the sarim, laharot hamim v'hasarim et yofia. So this also had a little bit of a political misdemeanor over here by virtue of the fact that she is not going to heed his politically oriented message. So Esther knows I have to somehow frame Haman of a personal offense, a very private personal offense, and also a political offense, oh, but that's not it. We heard about a very strange little detail of the story. Was the king willing to banish Vashti a priori? No, it was only after Memuchan, a close advisor, was there to suggest her banishment. So what's the other factor that we need? We need a suggestion of a close advisor. Now, please remember Esther's predicament over here. She basically isn't working with much. What do I mean by that? All she asked for is, okay, I can do as follows. I can try to set the scene as accurately as possible. So what does she ask for? A party. Where and what's going to happen at this party? She's going to do her best to make sure that Ahasuerus reaches a state of intoxication. That's number one. That she can control. As Ahasuerus, I want you to attend the party, but that's not all she asked for. I want you to attend the party together with Haman. and only Haman. Okay, you can't help it right now. Again, what is Ahasuerus thinking? Mm, that's right. You can all just say it. Exactly. I heard a fair suspicion. Again, she is planting this. Basically, she is framing Haman of an affair with the queen, which automatically, by the way, is tied up with political mutiny, in addition to wondering why is the closest advisor and going to be invited to this party together with the queen, who I already know from the Vashti story, again, had somewhat here of a disobedience issue, so maybe Esther is part of this plot as well, really unsure as to what's going on. By the way, can she control any of the other factors? What do I mean by this? Can she control whether or not there's going to be an advisor there who will make or offer any type of suggestion of banishment or killing? No, she has no control over that. Secondly, she has no control over whether or not the king is going to be sufficiently suspicious and angry. He has to read a state, reach a state, as we see as well, by Yiksov HaMelech Me'od. He has to reach a very high level of anger over here, in which case I can only imagine that after the previous episode, especially after the post-trauma effects and his regret thereafter, I'm sure his psychologist told him, next time you reach the state, what do you have to do? We're going to see this. You have to go outside to the garden, that's right, and take 10 deep breaths, and then come back in. And we're going to see how this is corroborated through the text itself. But let's continue for the moment. So Esther's going to try to do the best she can. And all she has going for her is the possibility of a party. Who remembers what happens? Comes the first party because the king says, okay, tonight, tonight, right now, I want to clarify what's going on. And he asks Esther at the party, how do you know he's already suspicious? I'll give you whatever you want. Just tell me what is going on. Are you going to disobey? Is there some mutiny? Is there some personal affair going on between you? And I really need to clarify the situation, giving us a sense of Ahasuerus' insecurity. However, comes the first party. Has anything changed? No. So what does Esther ask for? Another party? Let's see, I don't know, I don't know, maybe, maybe if I let this suspicion stay and ferment and percolate in your mind sufficiently, then 
maybe together with the wine, maybe you'll be able to reach the state of maybe. In the meantime, Anna, who remembers what happens after this party? Haman goes out, he goes home, and he uh, is on such a high. The queen, he, by the way, is the innocent victim over here. Yes, our sympathies, just for a moment, lie with Haman, who is so innocent because of his hubris that he doesn't even recognize that Esther is in the, uh, the process of framing him for something that he never, ever did. But on his way home, who does he meet? Mordechai, Asher, lo yichra, velo yishtachabe. And that's what leads Haman to go home. Notice these psukim. Again, we're in Perake, as you see, Pasuk Yud. Vayitapak Haman, vayavo el beito, vayashlech, vayavet ohavav. And he brings his fan club. And he definitely has a very large fan club right now, not only because of his high position in the government, but also he has declared this edict with the financial incentives with regard to annihilating the Jewish people. Notice Ohavav ve'et Zeresh Ishto. Is Zeresh part of his fan club? I can imagine not, because we're going to hear in the next pasuk, Vayisaper lahem Haman et kvod Oshro v'rov banav. Hamana is a little obsessed with himself as he speaks to his fan club about his great honor and the numerous children that he has. The only way he has numerous children is because he also has numerous wives. So Zeresh is the primary wife, but with uh, his promotion, he's been bringing in other women into the family as well. And notice what Haman chooses to pay attention to. Not a very wise character in the story. Vayomer Haman, af lo hivia Esther hamakam hamelech ala mishteh asher asata ki emoti. Do you know that Esther the queen only invited me to the party? Who's figuring out what's going on? Only a woman can figure out another woman's head. And sure enough, she realizes, oh my, can, don't you see what's going on? And maybe she herself is suspicious of Haman and Esther, what is going on between you? And because tomorrow, he says, I'm also invited to this private party. But at the same time, But notice Haman, with all that's good in his life, all he can focus on is his personal vendetta against Mordechai. And this already tells us something. Who does he remind you of? Someone who, because of a personal vendetta, is going to be encouraged to issue a national decree. There's a national crisis. We have to annihilate all the Jews because of my ill feelings towards Mordechai. Who else transforms a personal crisis or a personal affair into a national crisis? Memuchan. And one can even argue selfish Vashti, but definitely Memuchan, for which Chazal explain, oh, Memuchan is in fact Haman, Shemuchan, Lepuranut, because they basically do share the same personality, leading us to the Midrashic dialogue and the Midrashic device of a conservation of characters. But let's continue with Zeresh over here. Immediately after Haman says that he can't tolerate Mordechai Hayudi, Yoshe Bashar HaMelech, this is when Zeresh, who was not mentioned until this point, basically becomes a secondary character. She is going to help Haman, the primary character, propel the events that ultimately should lead to the immediate, so that Haman chas v'shalom, should have to wait an additional 11 months before killing off Mordechai. This will lead to the immediate demise of Mordechai. V'tomer lo zeresh ishto v'chol ohavav. Yasu eitz. That's all we need to know. Because we're going to take a look immediately thereafter at another story that appeared in the introduction for which we're wondering why we really needed the story. And this involves two tertiary characters, Shomrei Hasaf, known as Bigtan and Teresh, who we're going to, as you see, visit in just a moment. But their plot was also mentioned. Who remembers? All we hear about them is that they plotted against the king to assassinate the king. This plan was divulged to none other than Mordechai, who tells Esther, passive Esther, still at that point, to reveal this to Achashverosh. Now let's just keep this in mind for a moment, that Achashverosh, as we know, as we know does not reward Mordechai. 
He's only going to reward Mordechai later when he's hearing the stories of Sefer HaZichronot, and we'll see why. And at that point, when he hears about Mordechai, sure enough, it's repeated that he is the one who basically shared the information of Big Tan and Teresh's plan of assassination, which then forces us, the reader, to revisit what had been mentioned. Why did we need the story if we're going to refer to the story later as well? And the answer is just as you needed Vashti's plot in order to understand Esther's devising of her plan, so too you need to hear about Big Tan and Teresh in order to hear about Zeresh's plan. And this would make a phenomenal movie. Again, now listen to what goes on. Zera says, all you have to do is prepare a tree. Wait, a tree? Who gets punished with trees? People who perform treason, pardon the pun. And therefore, again, Big Tan and Teresh, anyone who poses a threat to the life of the king gets punished with hanging on a tree. That's all Zeresh says. She says, don't you realize how easy this is, Haman? All you have to do is frame Mordechai for what? For treason. And it's so simple. By the way, why is it so simple? Because Ahasuerus himself is already suspicious of Mordechai. How do we know that? Because after the Big Ten and Teresh affair, he didn't reward Mordechai. Didn't you always wonder why? But now it makes sense. Why didn't he reward Mordechai, who was the only one, apparently, who knew about Big Ten and Teresh's plan of assassination? What does that tell us? How does Mordechai know about it? Chances are that he was probably in on it and pulled out last minute, and that's why the king doesn't even know whether or not to reward him. Thank you very much, Mordechai, for saving my life, but how do you know about this? So you know what? I'm not going to reward you. I'm also not going to punish you, but am I suspicious? Can you imagine this? Zeresh has a brilliant plan. You have to give her a lot of credit. She basically says, all you have to do is report Mordechai to the king. And by the way, a king, whom we already know a little bit of Ahasuerus and his insecurities and paranoia, all you have to do is pose a potential threat to his life, and what will he do? He'll look into it, and by the way, we're going to see he does look into it. He's going to look into Mordechai, and what will he find out about Mordechai? that he knew about Big Tan and Teresh, and now you're going to, to frame him for treason, what will the king do? He'll say, hang him on the tree. So you already prepared the tree. This is going to be very simple. Yana, that's all you have to do. Eitz gaboa hamishim ama uba boker emor la melech. Now notice this. What does she say, though? Just wait till in the morning. V'yitluet Mordechai alav. That's so simple which is why we're supposed to, had we not known the end of the story, we're supposed to feel not merely a dialectic, we're supposed to feel dread right now. Because honestly, who has the better plan or who has the better chances of success of this plan? And note then that we have two contrary plots that are both fabricated. Aren't these brilliant women? Esther is framing Haman. Zeresh is framing Mordechai. Both of crimes that... They did not commit. I tell you, women are so brilliant. Yes, and us somewhat surreptitious and seductive. But back to this. In fact, we then see who really has the better chance. Zeresh, without question. I'm sorry, Zeresh has the better plan. Why? Firstly, threat to the king's life versus the possibility of a threat of some type of plot or offense. Hmm. Again, definitely now leaning in Zeresh's favor. And we don't even know for sure the proof, as we said, by Vashti, she basically is banished, whereas treason, I know you're going to, and there's going to be hanging. Not only that, there's going to be research that's done if someone is accused of treason. And very often, yes, it's going to be found. And, and we already have some basis for Mordechai. Aren't we nervous? We should be, and that's why we needed the Big Tan and Terra story. But we're going to see what in fact happens. So many strange events, namely Haman's hubris. To keep this in mind, what happens that very evening is that Haman doesn't exactly obey his wife. He is so uh, caught up with this plan. He is so excited by the inevitable result and success of the plan that he goes immediately to uh, the palace, and not just the palace, but 
the inner chamber is where the hangings would take place, and that's where Achashverosh, as we know, can't go to sleep. And who happens to be there, basically, in the middle of the night? Who is there in the middle of the night in the king's inner chambers? Haman, who, because of his hubris, which ultimately is going to lead to his downfall, he is so excited about Zeresh's plan that he can't help it. And he's not going to wait till the next morning. By the way, had he waited till the next morning, what would have happened? He would have gone to the, the king. It would have worked. And what would have happened to Esther's plan a few hours later? Messed up the whole thing. That's right. No way of framing Haman for something that, and ultimately, that's right, that he didn't do. If he just framed Mordechai HaYehudi, can she now say that the Jews are, and are innocent here? No way for Esther's plan to work. But because of a difference of just a few hours, Haman could not wait. And therefore, while the king can't go to sleep because he has one plan percolating in his head, namely, why is Esther inviting me to a party with Haman alone? It must be that there's an affair going on. And who happens to be in the inner chambers in the middle of the night? Haman, what is happening? Again, no, no proof of this yet, but this is adding, that's right, again, Fire too, again, to at the flame over here, no question. And then he's wondering, wait a second, why would someone be sleeping with my wife? Oh, there's only one reason why people do this, and that is to usurp the throne. But I'm not sure. This is all a suspicion that Ahasuerus has, but he has an opportunity now to test it out. And therefore, what does he ask Haman? He doesn't say, what can I do for Mordechai, who he just heard about? And by the way, just to show you that he's suspicious, he asked for the Sefer HaZachronot to be read before him. What are these Sefer HaZachronot? They're not happy memories. These are all about different plots of treason. So he reads about Mordechai, and by the way, he's not sure. Is Mordechai a savior, or is Mordechai a threat to him as well. So he asks Haman, who now he's wondering, wait, I'm also suspicious against you. That's why I'm reading about all these stories of treason. So Haman, are you really here, again, possibly to usurp the throne? What would you do to the Ish Asher HaMelech HaFitz Bikaro? And Haman, due to his hubris, falls directly into the trap. What does he ask for? Not just the clothing of the king, not just the horse of the king. He asks for the crown of the king. That's it without Esther's knowledge of any of this, without Mordechai's knowledge of any of this, without Zeresh knowing what's going on, what has happened? Esther's plan is, is now 25 points above Zeresh's plan. And what is it that Zeresh ultimately is going to say when she hears that Haman takes Mordechai through the streets of Shushan, screaming, Kachaya Seleish, Asher HaMelech HaFetz Bikaro, what does she know? She understands that her plan does not stand a chance. How can Haman ever go back now before the king and say that Mordechai is plotting treason when Haman fell into that trap? And therefore, Vayash of Mordechai El Shar HaMelech, Mordechai has no idea what went on. Esther is now wondering, what happened? that the king, without my knowledge, is so suspicious, but Haman fell into the trap of suspicion. No longer Ohavim. He no longer has a fan club. Now they're just the sages, and his wife mentioned second. And she says, Now there's no way that your plot against Mordechai can ever work. You shall continue to fall in front of him. So Zeresh is, in fact, a foil for Esther. She's not described as beautiful, but she is described as someone who plots a plot to frame the protagonist of the story exactly what Esther is doing. And it's Zeresh who ultimately recognizes that there are forces beyond in the story. But let's go back even to Zeresh's character. What is it that motivates Zeresh to frame Mordechai? Well, she's like Esther, really, 
who is going out of her way to frame Haman. So these are two vindictive women. What do you think? No. <coughs> Excuse me, because you already know that what is motivating Esther to do this, why does she plot her plot? <laughs> to save the nation selflessly. How about Zeresh? Why is she doing this? Ambition. Ambition. She herself tells uh, Haman <coughs> it's all about his kavod. It's all about his osher. It's about his honor. And she is the one who recognizes that this same honor or hubris is, in fact, his tragic flaw. So here we find this selfish Haman and Zeresh together with the selfless, not just Mordechai, but clearly Esther. Which brings me now to uh, our tertiary characters, and my favorite of whom are, as you see, Big Tan and Teresh. Baruch Adonai, Let's take a look at Biktan and Teresh. As we already discussed, we're wondering why they're even here. So now you all know, why do we need their story? This isn't just foreshadowing to understand how Mordechai eventually is going to be brought before the king. This is foreshadowing in order for us to appreciate the tension of the two plots, particularly whose brilliant plot? Zeresh. Zeresh, who knows that anyone who is tried for treason ultimately gets hanged on? A tree. As simple as this, we know this from Bigtan and Teresh, but there is more than meets the eye. The tertiary characters are in fact here to teach us something about the secondary characters. They are definitely here also to propel or help the secondary characters propel the plot. So in our case, it's not only propelling Mordechai for saving Achashverosh, but also, as we said, propelling Zeresh to contrive of her plan. But now, let's see their character in and of themselves. We hear about Mordechai sitting Bashar HaMelech, Katsaf Biktan Viteresh, Shnei Sarisei HaMelech, Mishomre Hasaf. These aren't merely eunuchs. These are the two closest eunuchs to the king. How do we know that? They are Shomre Hasaf, which literally means that they watch the threshold. And we're going to see exactly how and why. That is what is going to be the secret of their possible success, l'shloach yad b'melech ha'chashverosh. Because they are the ones closest to the king, they have the best chance of assassinating the king. How could they do this? Let us look at their names. They are big tan. Anyone who knows a little bit of ancient Aramaic, which as we know is the basis for the Persian and Babylonian languages, knows looking back just a few years at the story of Daniel, that Daniel refuses to eat from the Pat Bag HaMelech of Nebuchadnezzar. What is Pat Bag? Bag is Persian for Pat, which is bread. Who is Bag? Big Tan. Big Tan is the baker. And who is Teresh from Tirosh? You all drink the grape juice, but it's actually wine. We have a baker and a butler. Do they remind you of anyone? They are two really easiest officers to poison the king, the baker and the butler, reminding us certainly of, uh, of the two Sarim of Paro. Let's take a look at that story. Not only are they both accused of plotting, they're accused of plotting together, they dream together. Yosef divulges the interpretation of the dream together. They are viewed really as uh, being partners in crime. And that's all you need to know. And Chazal teach us exactly this. Again, in Masecha Megillah, Daf Yugimel Amud Bet, let's continue on page three. Chazal tell us, what do you know? Again, this isn't the first time that it happens. This is an allusion to the story of Yosef. Hashem goes out of his way to even bring in tertiary characters in order to say, for example, Yosef. Because through the, the butler, Yosef will be reminded of in front of Paro, and that's how he'll get out of the dungeon in Egypt. So too, through Bigtan and Teresh, what will happen to Mordechai? He'll be promoted ultimately to 
Mishne Lamelech, just like Yosef. Chazal tell us it's really not only an allusion to the story. So on one hand, you're thinking this is the secret to success. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to engage tertiary characters in order to facilitate and catalyze the salvation of the tzaddikim, which tells us that even Jews in the diaspora can succeed. But just remember that there are going to be various allusions to the story of Yosef, and we're going to discuss this next week as well, because it's not just about the story of Yosef being the success of a Jew in Egypt, but rather, what are the authors telling us? What happens after the ephemeral success of a Jew in the diaspora? Stay tuned because this is, in fact, the pattern of anti Semitism. But back to our tertiary characters. Just in case you're not convinced, that part of these characters is, in fact, to introduce us not only to the Sarim, not only to uh, the baker and the butler, and remind us of the Yosef story, but basically to teach us that whenever there's any plot going on, in the backs of your minds, you should already know that there are always partners in crime. And therefore, when we look at both, again, at the primary characters, and by this I mean the antagonist and the protagonist, one has to keep in mind that they're all going to work in in pairs. Just remember this. When you're thinking automatically, oh, who's the obvious pair of protagonists? Mordechai and, and Esther. Wait a second, who is Haman working with? Stay tuned. Gana, with this now, let's even prove this all the more. If I had a whiteboard, again, I would show this to you. Oh, I have a whiteboard. What do you know? Gana, let's see. Welcome. Gana, we're going to see something else about Nisman and marriage. known as Atbash. Are you all familiar with this? Gana, this is what I like to call biblical pig Latin. Gana, we're in. The letters really represent different letters, and this was used, and we have various ancient texts to prove this, as an ancient formula. I'm giving you sufficient time to allow you to figure this out. Who are Bikhan and Teresh? This is how Atbash works. The Aleph is parallel to? Bikhan. The Beth is parallel to? The Gimel is parallel to? Everyone see what's going on? Who are Bikhan and Teresh? They're, in fact, the team character, or basically, like Lewis, Lewis Carroll's Twiddledum and Twiddledee. They really are there together just to tell us they have the same function, but they're working as partners. And by the way, here's the proof. The Taf and the Nun again, are the, su the suffix of the name. The Vav and the Taf are the prefix of the name. Everyone see this? Who are they really? They are one character with uh, one job, one role that these are playing that ultimately are just showing us that they're working as partners in crime. Let's continue then and see how this is consistent. This is why Chazal tell us, let's turn back to another tertiary character as we discuss Mamuchan. All Mamuchan does is he seems to pop out from the middle of nowhere, proposing that Vashti was not acting uh, simply for selfish personal reasons, but transforming her her selfish uh, position into a national crisis. And that's why he proposes that letters go out, that the king fund, by the way, the, uh, the script and the sending of these letters to ensure that the men will stay in control. So where be told Sure enough, Chazal say, Memuchan Zahaman, Lama Nikra Shemo Memuchan, why are we going to conserve his personality? Shemuchan Lapuranut. And what this means is pay attention to this theme throughout the Megillah. All those who are going to be acting for selfish reasons and those that will even transform personal kavod, personal respect, personal problems into national crises. That's exactly what Haman does as he sees Mordechai lo yichra v'lo yishtachaveh. Therefore, some even explain that maybe this is even Daniel as a form of punishment, someone who also was at one point more concerned with his own, uh, own survival as opposed to the greater name of God or the greater survival of the Jewish people. Which brings us now to Harvona. Do we like Harvona? So uh, firstly, what is his role? He, again, is going to be another tertiary character, only appearing 
in a scene to ultimately not just propel a part of the story, but it's really propelling what happens to a Haman through a Hashverosh. Let's take a look at the story. Firstly, we hear Ava Harvona, and at the very beginning, by Yom Hashvi Kitov Leif Hamelach Bayayin, Amar Lumuman Bista Harvona, Bitava Vataz, the Tarbachaka, Shivata Sarisim, Hamisharitim, et Pne Hamelach Hashverosh. These are eunuchs. They may not be the baker and the butler, but who are they? They are the personal attendees of. Of uh, very nice, of a chashverosh. What it means by personal attendees is that they are there even at private affairs. And keep in mind that they're eunuchs, so they're not really a threat. So they're going to be there even though Esther had asked for an audience only with a chashverosh and Haman exclusively. But we're going to see that, what do you know? Charvona happens to be there at the moment that Esther has fully framed Haman. Let's just remember this. After she explains, do you know that my people have been uh, decreed to be annihilated? And she doesn't even mention Jews, knowing that Ahasuerus had never mentioned the Jews either. And uh, she says, you know, had you even uh, sold us as slaves, we would have been okay, and that would have been be better for your deficit as well. But again, in the meantime, you basically have decreed annihilation, to which, if you recall, Ahasuerus denies any responsibility. Me who zev is who, Hashem le'oli bo la'sodchen. And what does Esther do? Frames only. Haman, obviously, Isar Voyev, Haman Harahaze. But just as we mentioned, Ahasuerus' psychologist had already told him that last time this happened, he ended up banishing his wife and then regretting it. So this time, what do you have to do? The king goes out to, uh, to the garden, and I always imagine he takes 10 deep breaths. And what is Esther saying? to heal him under her breath. Because uh, what is she telling herself? Oh no, again, we're so close, so close to framing Haman, but I'm missing two factors. What are the two factors that are completely beyond her control? Whether or not the king is going to be sufficiently angry, again, as we're going to see, again, drunk and angry, beautiful. And what else is beyond her control? Whether or not there's going to be Again, a, an advisor who will at that moment advise the king what to do, just as Mamuchan had done in the case of Vashti. And what chances are there, especially because she knows that the Persians don't seem to be Jew lovers during this time, and she basically has divulged her identity. But what do you know? Hamelach shav meginat habitan al beit mishtahayayin, vahaman nofel al hamita asher ester aleha. Excellent. Wonderful, another help in the story. In which case, Chazal actually say, don't you see all the different events that are going on over here? It must be that there's a Malach in the story, pushing everything along, pushing Haman onto Esther. But it's really what? It's really Haman and his shortcomings again. Vayomer HaMelech, okay, I calm down, but this is too much. Hagam hadavar mi ufne Haman chafu. Vayomer you think that's enough? But wait a second. That would be enough to convict him like Vashti of some type of personal offense. To really get Haman out of the picture, Esther couldn't even do this. You really want to convict him of what? Of treason, of political treason. How do you convict him of political treason? Well, Gam Hineha Eitz. Do you know that Haman prepared a tree to frame Mordechai, who, by the way, you just honored for saving your life, Gana for framing him of treason. In other words, who is Haman? He is really not just someone who perhaps really plotted usurping the throne through Esther, but who else is he? He's working against Mordechai, who saved your life, because somehow Mordechai always finds these, these things out, and therefore, Harvona double frames Haman. Isn't this plot brilliant? Harvona knows about the tree, and therefore gets Haman out of the picture immediately, as we find, once there's a corroboration of treason, and only now is the king's anger assuaged. And why is this significant? Because now we take a look at this tertiary character, Harvona. Do we like him? 
wait a second, let's go back for a moment. Who were the only ones who knew about the tree? Remember the tree, the gallows that were prepared in the middle of the night? There are only a few people who know about this. Who were they called? They were called Haman's Ohavav. And what do you know from our previous tree and treason story, a big ton and terrorist? When people work, they, they don't work alone. They always work as partners in crime. Oh my, who is Harvona? He is Haman's inside man on the job. He was planted there to be the one to say, yes, Mordechai really is someone who's plotting against you. In other words, Harvona is just as bad as as Haman. He is Haman's partner in crime. He is Haman's, again, no one can even say, again, double antagonist within the story. He is one of the Ohavim. He is part of the Haman fan club. He is a Heinrich Himmler in the SS unit. In which case, and do we like Harvona or not? Let's take a look. Chazal tell us, I don't know. Rabbi Elazar says, what do you mean? Av Harvona Rasha. Doesn't everyone see this? Just like Big Tan and Teresh work together. It's a Harvona who knows about the tree because only the Haman advocates know about the tree. Boto et Sahaya, and therefore he is part of the Haman plot. Kivan Sharasha Lonit Kaimat Sato Miyad Barach. But he's not a very loyal fan because as soon as he sees that Haman is uh, convicted, that's right, he says, my only way out is by uh, Exactly, by adding now the fire to the flame. In fact, by ensuring that Haman is going to be convicted and hanged immediately before he divulges any of his associates. That's why in the Sechet Sofrim we find how should we be praising Hashem at the time of the conclusion of the Megillah? We thank Hashem, Baruch HaTah Hashem, HaKel, HaNekamot, HaMeshalim, Gamul, O'Ivim, Umagin L'Tzadikim, Omoshia Mo Miyad Sonihim. And then we sing Shoshanat Yaakov, wherein we bless Mordechai, Brucha Esther, Bruchim Kol Yisrael. Rab says, you also have to put in a curse against Haman, Arurim Banav, Amar Rabbi Pinchas Sarich Lomar, Harvona Zachur Latov. And you should also remember in the end, Harvona, it's true, he's not a primary character nor a secondary character, but did he help us out at the end? He was the linchpin. He was the one who finally, he's the man on the scene who's able to tell Achashverosh, just like Mamuchan, yes, you really should be hanging Haman at this point. Notice then how we pass on the halacha, the Tosfot Rush. The uh, Rush explains, I don't know, in the Yerushalmi, it says, after Kriyat HaMegillah, we talk about Mordechai and Esther and Arurim Kol Ha'arelim. But Rabbi Eliezer says that Harvona is really a Russia. But what do I do? Rabbi Pincha says that Harvona is a Latov. So uh, what do we find in the end, says the Tosfot Rush? Here's a perfect compromise. Harvona is not a Latov. Harvona is not a positive character amidst uh, the plethora of characters in Megillat Esther. He is an evil, vindictive character. But at the end, he helps save the day. Through what? This is how we're going to praise him. The gam Harvona Zachor Latov. Harvona's not good, but what did he say? Gam Neha Eitz. The gam of Harvona was a very positive one, which brings us, in fact, to uh, understanding then uh, the particular roles, as we said, uh, of all the characters. But there was one that lay in abeyance to a certain degree, and that is the character of Esther. Because we saw that, interestingly, if we look carefully at the Megillah, there are numerous secondary characters that could have played a greater role, whether it was Zeresh, who could have been a primary character had her plot succeeded, whether it was uh, even Memuchan, perhaps even Harvona, who could have been promoted. In the end, all of the negative characters are demoted. There's only one character who ultimately is going to be promoted from a supporting actress to a primary character, and that is none other than Esther. Esther, as we saw, who not only serves as a passive foil for Vashti and an active foil for Zeresh, is going to, on her own, transform herself from a passive character to an active character. And this, I would say, is the paradigm, then, of character development. So let's take a look at her transition and how, in fact, this takes place as we look at Esther Perak Dalid, which is going to segue very nicely into the last component of the shi'ur, namely appreciating structure 
to a certain degree through character development. To a certain degree, Mordechai's actions do not surprise us at all because we found that he is the one who takes care not only of his younger cousin, and he stands and stops by every day by Chatzar HaMelech in order to see what will happen to Esther. He is the one, as we'll pay attention to next week as well, who's going to facilitate the chances for Esther to be chosen and selected by the king. Even in the story of Bigtan and Teresh, it's ultimately Mordechai, Asher Tziva. He is still the one commanding Esther to do everything. So the very fact that he responds to the edict of the king against the Jews in an active manner does not surprise the reader. But this time he can't go any farther because, as we discussed last time in the Persian culture, you don't come without your Armani suit. And this is where Mordechai is going to begin to involve Esther. And all that Esther's attendees share with her is that Mordechai is the information that we just heard. That Mordechai can come farther into the king's arena because he is wearing sackcloth. And Esther is literally chola. She is disgusted. She is nauseous. She is sick. Why? Because Esther, over the course of the five years since she's been coronated, Esther has become assimilated herself within the Persian culture the external materialistic Persian culture. And Esther, upon hearing that her beloved cousin is now wearing sackcloth, is so sick in her stomach. How do we know? She sends him clothing. And this is always an interesting question. How many of you believe that Esther, who is queen, knows about the edict that has already gone out to 127 different countries in the provinces of Achashverosh, knows about the edict of annihilation against the Jews? How many believe that she knows this? Well, let's see. We're going to see that she definitely does. Again, number one, she should have known why Mordechai is dressed this way, and all she does is send him clothing. And the proof is going to be when Mordechai shows her the letter, is she shocked? No. She's even prepared her response. Namely, what do you mean? I can't do anything. I'm going to die. They're going to die. And I may as well just stay alive. And that's what Mordechai is going to address. But let's take a look at what happens. We then have one more tertiary character. His name is Hatach, and he's tertiary because Esther is the one who appoints him, and Esther is the secondary character for now. So she appoints a tertiary character named Hatach. What an appropriate name for the intermediary between herself and, Ach and Mordechai, who now are speaking different languages. She has been acculturated into the Persian culture of the palace of Achashverosh. Mordechai now has come out publicly as a Jew with his yellow star and his sackcloth. And now, never the twain shall meet. And therefore, she appoints Hatach, whose name literally means intermediary, Toch, the Tavach. He is the middleman. And therefore, she says, we're speaking different languages right now. She calls Hatach, Asher Hemid Lefaneha, Vatitzavehu al Mordechai. Our passive Esther has grown up for five years in the king's court, and now she is no longer a submissive Esther, who is going to be beholden to every word that comes out of her dear older cousin's mouth. Now she is the queen, and therefore she tells Mordechai, you're no longer going to tell me what to do. Rather, I am the queen. I will command you what to do. Ladat maze vi al maze. In other words, she knows what this is about, but what do you think you're accomplishing with this, Mordechai? How could Esther not know about this edict? And he sends a copy of it with Hatach. Esther, you're not going to tell me what to do. Do you remember our roles on the active one? I tell you what to do. You better go to the king and beseech the king on behalf of your entire nation. This is what we would call in modern day psychology a 
power struggle. And uh, so notice, Vayavo Hatach, they are not speaking the same language at all. Hatach comes and presents, presents this to Esther. Vatomer Esther la Hatach. Vatutzaveoel Mordechai. No, I'm the one in control. Kol avdei melech v'amadinot melech yodim et kol asher ish v'isha asher yavola melech al chatzar hapnimi. We already had the Vashti story, and everyone knows that if you disobey the king, and either you don't come when he wants you to come, or you do come uninvited. In case you, again, the only chance is, just if the king happens to respond to you on a whim, then maybe you'll live. But chances are, I haven't been invited to the king for 30 days. I don't think he's going to be so happy to see me. There's no command here. She basically is just explaining her wager. And this is what Mordechai says, but the formula is all wrong. That if now you use the king's palace to escape your identity, Again, I'm not worried about the Jewish people, Esther. They will be saved. But it's your Jewish identity, it's your heritage and legacy that's going to be lost. All Mordechai shares with her is, listen carefully, Esther. Right now, you have a choice. A choice that I believe each and every one of us have at some stage or stages in our lives. You have a choice right now, Esther, with regard to what character you're going to play in the story. Right now, you're a passive secondary character who has been doing not much other than helping the primary characters move the plot along. If you don't do anything now, then you are basically choosing not merely to become a tertiary character, but what will happen to you? You will disappear from the stage. Kim hacharish tacharishi beitazot at uvet avir tovedu. No one will know your name. No one will know not only your name, but no one will know your line because you have chosen to assimilate and not play any role. So many of us reach a stage in our lives where we're asked to either sometimes merely be passive or we have an opportunity to be active and change the trajectory not only of our personal lives, but of our national careers as well. He says, this isn't just a matter of staying a secondary character or becoming a primary character. Here's your opportunity, Esther, to become a primary character and change that trajectory, or otherwise disappear from the stage. There will not be a Megillat Esther. There will not be a history of Purim. There will not be a holiday. There will not be any line from you or, again, a line that beget you. That will entirely be lost, Esther. And this is your stage where you have to determine what character you're going to be in life. Are you going to be a passive player or are you going to write history together with God? And the rest, in fact, is history. This is the transition within the story according to the Pshat. Professor Fox points this out as well. This is the turning point when Esther as a character transforms herself from a secondary one to a primary one. Esther chooses, and notice how this is going to be said. Vayagidu l'mordechai et zivrei Esther. And now there we still saw hatach. But after this, vatomer Esther l'hashiv el-mordechai. No commands, no requests, and no middleman. Now we're speaking the same language. Hatach's role here is in fact to highlight the rift between Mordechai and Esther. And when he disappears, now we have the dynamic duo that will save the day. The active and the passive, the active characters, the protagonists of the story, and Vayavor Mordechai Vayas Kachol Asher Tifta Alav Esther. Esther has transformed herself into a primary character. And Chazal beautifully say this by telling us that when we hear that Mordechai took Esther as a bat, and that really is the pshat, he took her and nourished her and took care of her as a very uh, timid young girl. Chazal say, don't read it as a bat, as a passive character, but rather as a bayit. Read it as he eventually took her as a wife. 
What Chazal are telling us is she started off as a bat, but then what did Esther do on her own? She transformed herself into a bayit, into the home. She transformed herself into the active character. So much so that I always envision the last scene, which on one hand is described as Mordechai writing the story down as an Igeret, but then we hear it called Tokef Igeret HaPurim Hazot Hashemit, written and authored by Esther. And I always imagine that, again, the two of them are sitting and they're thinking, so how are we going to market this? Are we going to call it Megillat Mordechai, and Esther probably says, what a nice alliteration. Again, yes, Megillat Mordechai, you're the one who started this Mordechai, you should get the credit. And then I imagine Mordechai turning to Esther and saying, but do you remember when I told you that if you were going to be passive, atu veit avich tovedu? In the end, who writes down kol tokef igeret hapurim hazot hashinit? Not just Esther, but Esther bat avichayom. You not only saved yourself, Esther, and not only will every single Jewish woman, Jewish man know who you are, but they'll know who your father was as well. And they'll know where you came from, and they'll know the actions that ultimately saved the Jews here in Persia. And therefore, Esther, there's no question, what are we going to name this Megillah? In your schut of saving the name, we're gonna name it Megillat Esther which brings us to our last component. And that is appreciating that Esther transforms herself in a moment of crisis, but not of personal crisis as she says, she's going to be fine. It's a moment of national crisis. The protagonists of the story are those that are willing to put their selfish concerns, even their personal survival aside, and transform themselves into characters who will save the nation, as opposed to the antagonists and the numerous secondary and tertiary characters of the story. But now we progress to the last component of appreciating the general structure, not of particular characters, but of the plot of the story. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with this chiasm within Megillah Tester. Chiastic structure from the Greek word chias, meaning an X, which generally not only is going to denote an inclusio format or what Chazal call a chatima mi'em p'ticha, closing of the story the way that it began, an ABBA structure. But that gives us a certain sense of lack of development. Rather, more often than not within chiasm is not merely inclusio, but also some type of transition, showing us that there is development within the story, not only character development as we've been highlighting until this point, but also development of the plot wherein there's always a transition that's either a climax or a nadir. Let's take a look at the brilliant and also very overt chiastic structure within Megillah Tester. The story, as we saw, that begins with Achashverosh's kingdom, and now you're going to have to do a little v'nahafochu, even with the pages themselves. As uh, you look at the beginning with uh, the tokef, the strength of Achashverosh, and the conclusion, Achashverosh's kingdom, also the strength, this time manifest through the international taxes. But we began with two private feasts, one for the princes of the provinces for 180 days, followed by the uh, special feast for the inhabitants of Shushan, including apparently the Jews of Shushan, seven days of Miluim, v'chatzar ginat bitan hamelech. And note that at the end, we also have two feasts for the Jews, one in all the provinces, that's going to be celebrated, as we know, on Yudalid Adar, and then the one particularly for Jews in Shushan, that Chazal will transform into what we call today Shushan Purim, in the walled cities conquered during the time of Yeshua ben Nun, and that will be, again, on the 15th of Adar. So two feasts, one for the provinces, one for Shushan, both at the beginning and at the end. Esther appears before the king and is chosen as the queen. Esther comes before the king and is going to be very active as opposed to passive. She basically is going to be the one to request and ultimately be granted the request of going out to war an additional day of battle in Shushan. The description of Haman's stature, the beginning of Perikimel, Achar Hadvarim Ha'ele, and the twelfth year, Gidal Hamelach Hashverosh et Haman ben Hamdata Vayinasehu, and he promoted him. What do you know? Those exact same verbs are going to apply and be uh, be incorporated as we see in the transformation of the stature of Mordechai. In uh, the second D, all the princes and the provinces, Minasim, everyone respected and promoted the Jews because Mordechai was Gadol. Mordechai himself 
was great. We had the casting of the lot that leads to the war in the 13th of Adar, and then at the end of the story, the actual war. The giving of the ring to Haman, which allows him to dictate the letters of the annihilation of the Jews, Mordechai rending his clothes, the fasting of the Jews. Every single one of these aspects is going to be reversed, namely the giving of the ring to Mordechai. Mordechai writes the letters, the dressing of Mordechai in royal garments, and once again, the feast of the Jews. Esther has a feast, and then she has a second feast. But a lot happens in between, namely Haman's consultation, what we'll even call Zeresh's plan, against working against Esther's plan, and Haman's consultation with his associates again. But what had happened in between, the king cannot sleep, and instead, Haman is the one to advise the king, what should you do for the one whom the king requests to honor? Dress him up lead him through on the king's horse with the king's clothing and crown with a, one of the noblemen yelling through the streets of Shushan, but it's not going to be Haman on the horse, but rather Haman leading Mordechai on the horse. And this is where we find exactly again, the terminology of the form equaling the content. Let's take a look at Esther Perektet, Pasuk Aleph, Ubishne Masar Chodeshu Chodesh Adar. In case you didn't see the structure, say the authors, take a look at what happened. The 13th of Adar came, but in the meantime, what has happened? There's an inverted structure, otherwise known as chiasm. Everything has turned topsy-turvy, and all because of we noted that the transformation in the story, the transition, was Esther's transformation from a secondary passive to an active primary character. But now we see that with regard to the plot, the plot is actually going to transform with the restless night of the king. And what does this night tell us about? Well, if we look at other, the king himself, is going to be in a state of despair, is going to feel as fragile and vulnerable as ever. And we're going to see this through the other balai lahus, which means that Esther's plan is working in the sense of at least, again, at the inception and at the plotting of framing Haman. But what other balai lahus that do we have? We have the lailahu, wherein the daughters of Lod basically intoxicate their own father and deceive him. And not to, uh, as we know, conceive both with regard to with the older daughter and the younger daughter. If we turn to page six, we see other examples of this exact terminology. When Lavan is in the middle of pursuing Yaakov, and Yaakov has basically taken what Lavan feels, not just his family, but all of his ruchush, Hashem is the one to come and say, yes, you should feel very vulnerable right now because I'm going to protect Yaakov. But Yaakov himself feels very very vulnerable. We see this also in Perek Lamed. Sorry, Perek Hafav was Yaakov himself running away to Lavan, feeling very vulnerable. Hashem coming to him and reassuring him. Yaakov coming from the Sadeh. Again, Yaakov is passive in the story, and it's Leah who's going to tell him where he's going to go that evening. This is Yaakov now, nervous with regard to his encounter with Esav. And therefore, all in one night, he is going to prepare for war and also send a mincha and also get up in the middle of the night to cross over. Balailahu depicts a very frail character, and this is the other play of the characters in the story. We mention almost every character other than our primary protagonist whom we thought the story was all about. And that was none other than Achashverosh. The story starts with him. The exposition is all about Keshevet HaMelech Achashverosh Al Kisei Malchuto. The story ends with his strength and his fiscal tax over 127 lands, to which, by the way, even the Jews are going to be subjugated. And all that Mordechai is is a Mishneh Lamelech. So as much as you think that he's the primary protagonist, the author basically says, again, no, he's only second to... Hamelech, he's second to the king, who clearly is a chashverosh. But then we look at the story and we see that everything actually happens to a chashverosh. It may appear, and yes, he is active. He is conducting parties. He issues attacks. 
but everything else in the story happens to him. On one hand, he's portrayed as the primary protagonist. On the other hand, the transition and the chiastic structure point to anything but that. He is a passive protagonist. He is vulnerable. All the events and the shifts of the story, allowing the turnabout of the Jews against the Persians will not happen because of Achashverosh, but rather despite of Achashverosh. He is extremely vulnerable within the story. And therefore, what we find is that on one hand, the transition is obviously teaching us everything is going to turn around. But the transition is always there as the focal point of the story as well for us to understand what is truly happening. So much so that we find a very interesting minhag mentioned in Masechet Sufrim, wherein in the months of Adar, they would already start reading the Megillah on Shabbat, very similar to the minhag of Shabbat HaGadol, of reading the Haggadah, so that we're already going to be conditioned and almost perceptive and sensitive to the words of, the, of Megillah Tester. And according to Chazal, the Shabbat HaRishona of Adar, what would we read this Shabbat? Or last Shabbat, we would have read the first part of Megillat Esther, Ad Balailahu Nadadash Natamelech. See part one of the story, Act One. And then next Shabbat, Shabbat Zachor, Uva Motzei Shabbat Shnia, Korin Mi Balailahu Ad Vidover Shalom Lachol Zaro. Read until the end, because this is clearly the transition. The transition where you see that the king is ultimately vulnerable. He's the one in a state of fear. Notice that there are two plots that he is now conflicted about. Should I reward Mordechai or is Mordechai plotting like Haman plotting? And I don't even know what to do, even though both of these characters, in fact, have merely been framed, teaching us that No, the authors are right. The Melech is the protagonist. The Melech is the primary character. The melech is the mover and the doer in the story. But which melech? Not a chashverosh. Balailahu nadadash nat hamelech. There's a melech machi hamelechim that is the true protagonist of the story. And this Megillah, as Chazal, as we learned last week, Chazal telling us there's no mention of God in the story. There is no mention of God because we don't always see God as the active character. But sometimes when the passivity of the primary character is going to be manifest, then you simply have to look a little harder to see who's in control of the various activities. And in fact, that's why the Jews, when they see the victory, they recognize, oh my, we're going back to the beginning of the story. But when we go back to the beginning of the story, there is a little bit of a change. Not only are we going to be, again, continuing here in Persia, as we said, unfortunately, not making Aliyah to Eretz Yisrael, still being subject to the king's taxes, but they do change their perspective somewhat. If the culture of Persia was all about mishte, 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 the drinking, and one can even argue the state of vulnerability when one is inebriated, then what do the Jews do? They celebrate mishte, don't worry, but mishte ve simcha. And not only that, but they change it to simcha u mishte. We're not going to drink in order to be happy. Rather, we are going to drink because we're happy. We are going to actively reach that state and express it also through the activity of mishloach manot ish l'reyehu umatanot le'evyonim. And that's why there is one small transition that comes through recognizing God's active hand when the Jews continue not only with the feasts of the story, but also the fasts of the story. And this is the last device of structure. There are scholars that maintain that beyond the chiasm, we see that there's also a motif, the motif of mishta'ot. There are no less than 10 parties in the story. 
And even if we find two parties at the beginning, as we mentioned, in the provinces and in Shushan, and two parties of the Jews at the end, we see the party of uh, Haman and, um, and Ahasuerus, and the parties of the Jews, Layudim Haita Urav Simcha. We see the two parties of Esther, the parallel one to the other. But when the Jews party, we don't just party. We don't just drink. We drink, but we also fast. That it's true that there are feasts at the beginning and at the end, and the feasts basically help move the story along from one to the other, depicting the culture of passivity throughout the time period, which, as we said, highlights who is truly involved and active in the story. And it's not just Mordechai, and it's not just Esther that transforms herself, but in fact, it's a melech machei hamlachim. But Esther has said that there are one, there is one other group of tertiary characters, and those are going to be none other than the Jews, the Jews who don't have individual names because they're supposed to come out lech knos et kol hayudim. They don't come out as individuals, but they come out as a people. Nikahalu. They are going to be assembled together. And they have to remember that when they come out in a mishte, there has to be a mishte also with divrei tzomot v'tzakatam. When we party, we also fast. And that's why instead of fasting like Esther on the three days of Pesach, we fast right before our feast. We fast just like on Yom HaKippurim, where we feast and then we fast in order to show our confidence in Hashem for giving and atoning us for our iniquities, on Purim, we first fast in order to then feast. We recognize that the only way that we truly were able to merit salvation is because we accept it upon ourselves to do something. We accept it upon ourselves to identify as the Jewish people. And just as Esther, who is willing to sacrifice selflessly her life on behalf of the nation, the nation recognizes that in order for this story and the salvation of the Jewish people to be perpetuated, it must come not just with the mishte, and not even just with simcha, and not just with mishloach manot and matanot levionim, but it must come with divrei hatzomot v'zakatam. And that's why Purim is not only preserved for the poor of Haman, but also Yom Kippurim should be resonating in the backs of our minds, recognizing that we're going to take from the inactive, passive characters, but we're also going to learn all the more so for, from their foils, the active characters. And on Purim, we're going to show that we are not only going to recognize salvation through the passivity of denying ourselves food, rather perhaps the greater challenge. We're going to show God that we recognize salvation through channeling our selfish strengths into national victory and anticipation as we feast together as the, uh, as, uh, the Jewish people, together with Mordechai and Esther, recognizing that individual characters are meant to truly highlight, highlight the national character of the Jewish people. Firm Sameach.